Hi, this is the creator of the HoofyTube channel speaking. Team Fortress 2 has been a big part of my life since I was 11. Over the last 5 years I have been making various TF2 shorts with varying amounts of acclaim. To put it simply, I haven't always succeeded. So after my few last videos were met with a lukewarm reception, I decided to return to the basics and ask myself this. How did the Valve team manage to create filmmaking masterpieces out of videos that are essentially advertisements for a game? Before I begin though, I want to say that this video isn't me trying to proclaim that my opinion is in any way correct. Art is far too complex of a thing to do such a thing with a straight face. However, that's a topic for another day. But hold up. That isn't to say that there aren't certain guidelines and tricks that have been used throughout time to create movies. And this is what I want to do in this video, is to go for these different elements, explain how they work, how they complement each other, and how they help to make some of the most acclaimed shorts of all the time work. Before I continue with the video, I want to kindly thank the sponsors of TF2 Hunt for sponsoring my upcoming video, which will be released shortly after this one. If you are of age, they offer coin flips with TF2 items and various giveaways. Without further ado, let's move on to the first point. There isn't a single other FPS shooter with characters as fully fledged and iconic as the 9 classes of TF2. I could and probably would argue that there isn't a single other game with characters as well written as these. But why? Well, what makes a good character? That's a trick question as there really isn't a singular answer. So, let's put my Polish literature lessons to good use. Aristotle, in his book Poetics, aside from a lot of sexism and questionable things about slaves, writes about creating a good character. He states four points. Let's go through them. Point one. Goodness. A character must be good. Wait a minute. Pretty much all of the most iconic characters portrayed on film aren't good. They are bad. How are any of the TF2 characters even close to goodness? Didn't Heavy laugh when he was murdering helpless soldiers? Well, Aristotle's point is that even the antagonistic characters should exhibit some sort of goodness. Despite being written 2000 years ago, this still holds very true, as it is now common to add many sympathetic qualities to villains, just for the sake of the audience being able to connect with their eventual downfall. The TF2 characters have got certain favorable traits as well. For instance, Spy, despite being a cold-blooded killer, is willing to help his team in a tough time. Look at him go. He even brought a bucket. Bucket. This helps the characters not be unsympathetic caricatures. Ah, ma petit chauffeur. There's a little bit of good in even the worst characters, and that makes them more relatable. Point 2. Consistency. This is rather simple. The characters must adhere to the stuff behaviors they were assigned, and they cannot change inexplicably. If a character is meant to be represented as calm, they shouldn't be going on angry runs. Yes, I'm looking at you, Hoovitube. Very similitude. The characters should be constructed in a way we can relate to. Then again, with the TF2 characters, it is a stretch to say that those characters are very relatable. Many people stutter when they are asked if they want additional ketchup with their fries, and that's pretty far from people who kill on a daily basis. However, I would argue that all the nine classes have got certain desirable traits, or at least relatable ones. For example, Sniper not being respected by his family, despite his personal self-satisfaction. Scouts desire to be respected by his teammates, and heavy lacking sandwiches. You get the picture. And for propriety? And yeah, this is just more sexism and stratification from Aristotle. Who'd have guessed? <laughs> However, I want more than that. Let's use those points as groundwork for a more solid summary. I believe that the TF2 character's beauty lies in their cinematic potential. They are all perfect to be in a movie. Someday you'll understand that. No, not like that. I mean that those characters are fully fledged individuals and aren't meant to be plastered around cheap merchandise from Asia. McKean in his book Story, which is by the way owned by every amateur filmmaker, states that true character is revealed in a choice a human being makes under pressure. 
what he essentially means is that we show our true colors in rough situations. For instance, in expiration date, engineer and medic try to find a solution to the rough situation that they have encountered. He tells us that they are intelligent and brave. When we put them side by side with, say, soldier, we see the contrast between them. I have done nothing but teleport bread for three days. Those kinds of moments cleverly lay out the nature of the cast, frequently both positive and negative, but mostly negative. Oh, good, good! Could we have more like that, please? Now, what kind of a guru are you anyway? These established personality traits in a feature film can contradict each other, creating a moral dilemma. Scout choosing that hurting his ego is less important than the date with bombshell mispalling is by far my favorite example. Some are of course more subtle than others, like Heavy, whose character conflict would be being a stoic methodical man or a raging psychopath when need be, or Medic's will to make great inventions interfering with how patients should be treated. That's what I mean when I say that these characters are cinematic. It may seem all simple. Characters need personality. But when we look at most game adaptations to film, they are usually critically panned and it is revealed how uninteresting those characters are. Despite the fact that the differences of the nine classes stem from how the game developers wanted them to be told apart from each other, this resulted in thousands of fun videos with interesting storylines and character interpretations. It's just a blast to watch a couple of ragtag nut jobs with strong beliefs being thrown into a room together. It's like politicians are going. Simply put, contradictory or contrasting personality traits can make characters much more memorable. Because, what is memorable about a stoic philosopher? Not much. And what is memorable about a crazy person? Not much. And what is memorable about a crazy stoic person? This. So, I suppose Aristotle would find TF to have you very compelling. Thanks for coming to my TED talk. The troll. Now an easier topic. The brilliance of the nine classes is visible in the variety of different stories told in SFM, GMOD or 2D animation. There are dramatic tales about betrayal, sadness and grief, action-packed and comedic shorts that haven't aged a day since they were posted, or even bonkers stop-motion videos where characters are reduced to caricatures that slither on the ground like snakes on crack cocaine. <laughs> Exaggeration and dramatization of strong traits, like devotion to the art of medicine, is what allowed these videos to be so effective. However, the tone that the media creators settled on is a mix between those two. The nature of the nine classes allows these shorts to be both hilarious while under the surface quite dramatic. Like, let's not forget that Meet the Scout is about the violent narcissist, or how Meet the Pyro is an allegory of propaganda and brainwashing. While it has been proven that TF2 characters can be a source of compelling drama, the media team team realized that trying to make people strongly emotional in a 5 minute short is silly. When rushed and unearned emotional beats are presented, it comes across as pompous and embarrassing. Why? I'm fucking kidding with you! You fucking shoot the guy! <laughs> the TF2 creators weren't toned, however. The credit here goes to Eric Walpole the lead writer of the Valve games, as well as Expiration Date and all the nine meet the shots, for understanding the comedic potential of those characters. I may not be wasting my money after all! <laughs> Look at them! Marvelous, isn't it? The comedy. Delivering comedy successfully is surprisingly hard. The current stage of millennial comedy is so bizarre that it's hard to even define a humor anymore. <laughs> I'm getting sidetracked here. Right, the TF2 shorts are goddamn hilarious. Ignoring much needed impeccable delivery from the cast, successfully crafting laughs in shorts is immensely hard. Here's how a classic joke works. We establish a situation or a premise and in a way that is consistent with the characters or the logic of said premise, we subvert the audience's expectations in a clever yet logical way. But... <laughs> That's why bottom and upper text memes are such a popular template. Here's an example from Meet the Soldier. The joke is here that it is revealed that Soldier has been talking to severed heads all along. This joke could have easily been made not funny. The well-placed cut, the lack of camera movement in the reveal shot make it more awkward. The delivery and the build-up, it's all flawless. Knowing this, here are five things that the mid the shorts rely on to make the audience laugh. Stage 1. Making it true with the characters. 
Humor comes from character. The biggest laughs usually come from interaction between the two characters. The contrast between their personalities and the consistency in them allows the jokes to work. Okay. That's why the final punchline of Meet the Soldier would not work if it was Scout, because it wouldn't be consistent with his personality. Stage 2. Pushing and understanding boundaries. The lack of boundaries of what is acceptable due to the fact that Meet the Shorts weren't aired on live TV allows for quote-unquote adult content. However, the Meet the Team team weren't hacks and were aware that the violence in itself isn't funny. However, the truth is, things surrounding violence can be funny. Meet the Team sought to find humor in other places than just ketchup spraying all over. Like here. The humor isn't in how Spy got punched. Second degree battery in itself isn't funny. The joke is that Soldier approaches fighting like a complete nut. Me? The violence adds to the humor, but it isn't a joke in itself. <laughs> Stage 3. The present absurdity. Well, no sane person would keep the head of an enemy spy in their fridge. That's absurd. But not too absurd. Meet the team found the golden mean between being so absurd that it's confusing and being so tame that we get bored. The golden mean can of course be pushed around. A little bit. Stage 4. Making it fresh and unique. They were aware of cliches that were present in modern movies at the time. Like Medic, instead of saying a motivating line of dialogue on the cue of the rising music, says I, I have no idea! The literary term for this is Bathos, which is an anticlimax to create comedic effect. Comparing to ten tall movies that came out that year, this type of humor wasn't that common, which is why Meet the Team Shorts remained so iconic and rewatchable even a decade later. And 5. Making the right length. When a joke is too long, we catch on to what the joke is before it's finished, which ruins the punchline, but when a joke is rushed and too fast, we get confused. Finding the perfect timing of a joke is hard, but here are some tips. After a punchline is delivered, the video should leave a second or two for the audience laughing, but that short break doesn't mean that the video should completely stop, in case an audience member doesn't find the joke funny. scene while telling jokes should also move the plot forward and should change its pace so the viewer is on their toes, not knowing when another joke is going to strike. To summarize, to construct funny jokes in movies, be consistent with the characters, be daring, be weird, be unique, be unpredictable. Unless you are a goddamn teenager like me, you'll find anything obscure funny. <laughs> the term well written has been unfortunately destroyed, decimated and otherwise killed by Reddit. However, let's try to pinpoint what exactly makes up good writing. Let's look at two examples. You can kill people with guns. What does this line say about the person who said it? Well, nothing really. Maybe he is an analyst who describes what guns are for. Maybe a slightly intoxicated person. Maybe a child. It isn't filled with any personality. Now check this out. If you have to meet someone that can outsmart the bullet. Well, this one has a lot of personality, and not just because it's one of the many iconic lines from the Meet the Shorts. The flawed grammar suggests that the person saying it is not from America. The emphasis on me in I have suggests that the person saying it is proud of himself. The usage of outsmart suggests that the person saying it is not confident with his knowledge, but perhaps knows a thing or two about killing. That is just exceptional writing. Crafting such memorable lines of dialogue while being forced to commit to the right cast of characters and making it look easy is such a satisfying feat to gander at. What's important to realize is that witty dialogue on its own doesn't work. And everything's uh, good? Good at home? Well... <laughs> That's what many SFM videos suffer from. The characters say well written lines of dialogue, but they don't really talk about anything. Oh, did I get that on your suit? Now what is subtext? It refers to putting a different layer of meaning under the surface of another thing, like here. Oh, good, good. So, we're both busy. The thing is, Scott isn't talking about the virtues of hard work on weekends. It was an awkward attempt to have banter with Miss Pauling. Uh, gotta go. That's the subtext. Instead of saying please have children with me immediately, people usually in a subtle way communicate their desires. A good rule to keep in mind is to never open your characters' mouths unless those characters want something. You are better than me, alright? Again, this isn't Scout recognizing Spy as a worthy man. This is Scout putting his ego aside and seeking Spy's help. I need your help. Now we have the dialogue. Now let me explain how stories work. Let me make an example. The prince and the princess married and lived happily ever after. That's pretty boring, right? We need to have a bit of drama. Shut up! Get out! Get out of my life! You fucked up. 
Go ahead, Karen. Returning to expiration date again. Scout's goal is to go on a date with Miss Pauling, but the obstacle is the fact that he has only three days to live. The video manages to stay entertaining because there are new obstacles in the way, like Scout having to seduce Spy. Got a bucket of chicken. Other mid the team videos are structured like amateur documentaries. I'll be honest with you, my parents do not care for it. And Meet the Spy and Meet the Mandic are a bit like movie scenes, but they rely on creating a situation and putting the characters in it as well. No? Yes, of course there is more minutia, here's some of it. However, the previously mentioned elements are certainly enough to deliver a competent short, but surprisingly enough, many SFM videos fail at that miserably. And yes, me in particular. There's truly no way to describe the feeling of seeing your favorite anime character pass away. On three! Three! Yeah! Oh. <laughs> You're dead! Five, cinematography. So we have good characters, the tone and jokes and writing covered. That's basically a book. What I call cinematography is the lighting, framing and camera movements being used to tell the story. Originally in this part I was going to shot for shot analyze the incredibly smart planning of camera placement and motion in Meet the Spy, but I don't want to bore you to death. 99% of you watching this video right now have not noticed the camera movement in Meet the videos. That means it's bad camera movement, right? No. Because it is fucking good. Kill everyone you know. Some directors want you to notice their camera movement. However, some want their work to remain invisible. The TF2 videos land in the middle, slightly leading to a more stylized way of shooting things. Here are a few points that illustrate how the cinematography significantly improves the mid the videos. 1. Movement. You probably know that when you spin around in your chair, you will see blur. This phenomenon is used a great deal in Meet the Spy. When things are intense, the camera moves a lot. It pans, it dollies, it shakes and zooms a lot to show how fronty the situation is. They also rely on using classical camera motion. They dolly in to make the audience focus on something. They pan in the other direction to reveal something. All that classic stuff. 2. Size. Alfred Hitchcock said that bigger is better, I mean, the size of an object in your frame should be proportional to its importance to the story at the moment. Like this knife right here. It takes 80% of the screen, which foreshadows that it will come to play later. Or you mean the heavy. This engineer right here. He takes 5% of the screen at most. That means that he isn't important to us right now. 3. Lighting. In Meet the Spy, the titular character is constantly shown being drowned by shadows to symbolize that he is a threat. And in this video, brightness, which symbolizes heaven, goodness and purity, surrounds Medic as he saves his team. Balance matters as well. The choice of composition, where characters are in relation to camera, their position and point of elevation, can tell a much better story than just words sometimes. Like you can understand what's going on in this scene, just by the fact that Spy is constantly shown towering up over his teammates and turning his back on them. For lens choices. This is just technical stuff for nerds like me. People see the world like 35mm lenses. Ah! When a 70 plus mm lens is used, the surrounding seems tight and close to the foreground. It doesn't feel natural. It can be used to show that the characters are uncomfortable, unstable or stressed. Not good! The camera shaking is amplified, but the camera movement seems less extreme. When 35mm lenses are used, things seem natural, well balanced, just like our eyes. <laughs> He's nice. When 60mm lenses are used, the surrounding seems way too open. It doesn't feel natural as well. Heavy has little baby head! It can be used to show that the characters are under the influence or when they are scared. Oh, yes! The camera shaking is not as noticeable and the camera motion is magnified. Good shit! The task of a director behind the camera, like me, is to choose between all those elements, pick the ones that are right for the story, that are right for the scene, and that are right for the particular moment. I will admit, it's certainly hard, but when it's done well, the right people will notice and the right people won't. The credit here goes to Vault Director Robin Walker and his team for approaching these shots as if they were actual movies. And let me quickly make this point. There is a very frustrating belief if it comes to what good filmmaking is. Many think that just because a movie has got newer technology, it is a better made movie, but that usually isn't the case. Taking James Cameron's almost 30 year old epic Titanic and comparing its special effects to Hobbit, that came out 7 years ago, we can see that scenes from the former hold up much better despite the technological leap forward. 
It's not just because James Cameron understands how gravity works. He understood that technology should be used to tell the story. The story should not be a mere vehicle for showing off technology. Same goes with SFM shorts. Yes, the textures and rendering in Mitte have been are a bit dated. Maybe. Look at his nose. It's a bit crooked. But let's ask ourselves this question. Would improving the quality make this video funnier? I am heavy weapons guy. Absolutely not. The unpolished look of the original is part of what made the video so hilarious. It does feel like a homemade video of a gigantic Russian man going on about bullets and his gun. It's hysterical. The rough quality of it adds to the charm of it. Technology is just a tool, and in the hands of someone intelligent, it's one of the most powerful storytelling tools. Before the video ends, I want to sum a few things up. I didn't make this video only to learn about SFM. One of the reasons why I'm making this video is because I'm upset about how poorly people involved with filmmaking are treated. Ever since any uneducated guy on YouTube can get loads of acclaim and more money than I or you will ever hold in a bank account a week by making surface level observations about movies, treating directors like dirt became the norm. She was so like all us writers when we first hit Hollywood, itching with ambition. Audiences don't know somebody sits down and writes a picture. Hopefully, this video can make that negative stigma towards filmmakers go away, as I have shown how much thought, heart, sweat and intelligence is put into making every movie. So if you finish watching this video about a teenager rambling on about filmmaking in broken English and still feel like you didn't get much from it, I will leave you with this. If your friend, relative or anyone else pursues a hobby, encourage them. They can come a long way if they are surrounded by the right people. Maybe one day, 40 million kids like me can have your work embedded in their hearts. A do was Polaczków to niespodzianka w postaci głosu bez okropnego akcentu. Trzymajcie się, pa!